Okay, it's 12 o'clock, so we'll st get started. Are we good to go? Okay. All right, thanks everybody for coming to the Western Heritage Center for this high noon. We've been really excited about it. Um, my name is Cecilia Gavinsky, and I'm the collections manager here at the museum. I'm introducing our speaker today. Lauren E. Hunley has spent over 17 years in the museum field, earning her Master's of Arts in Learning and Visitor Services in museums and galleries through Leicester University in England. She's worked for both small museums and national museum service organizations. She is the author of 101 Museum Programs, 101, excuse me, Museum Programs on a Shoestring Budget, and has presented at numerous museum conferences. She is currently the Community Historian at the Western Heritage Center in Billings, and serves on the Board of Directors for the Mountain Plains Museums Association. Her recent projects include Conquering Diseases of the Past, seen over here, Saints and Sinners, Women Breaking Tradition, and Healthcare on the Crow and Northern Cheyenne Reservation, also in house right now. Um, if you guys could just remember to turn off your cell phones, just a friendly reminder. And then also, we have another high noon this month. We have two. November 18th is um, from Kevin Koistra, the Promoting the Old West, 1910 through 1940. So, we are very excited to get started. Here's Lauren. Thank you, guys. I gotta get everything set up, right? Okay, well I really appreciate everybody coming. I also appreciate the flexibility. This program was originally scheduled for the week of Halloween, Montana Monsters, felt pretty apropos, but unfortunately um, we had a, an unplanned uh, issue and, and had to reschedule it. So thank you everybody for being flexible and adjusting to that. Uh, I do want to start off today just being upfront and establishing a baseline for us. Um, the Western Heritage Center, uh, our program today is not intended to prove or disprove the existence of these creatures. Uh, instead, we're looking at the history, we're looking at the influence of cryptozoology as a contested field, and we're doing that through the lens of the five cryptids who have been sighted in Montana. So in that vein, the Western Heritage Center neither confirms nor denies the existence of these creatures. I uh, just want to get that up front so that we all understand where, how we're moving forward with this. Uh, although I will say that there's some very interesting information in, included here. So for those of us who might be unfamiliar with cryptozoology as a field, uh, cryptozoology is taken from three Greek roots, cryptos, meaning hidden, zoon, meaning animal, it's the same word, root word we get zoology from, and then of course logos, which is the study of. And so as such, cryptozoology is um, really, it's the study of animal species whose existence is not supported by empirical evidence. Uh, cryptozoologists and the creatures covered under the umbrella of cryptozoology are entirely naturalistic in origin. Um, they are not as opposed to being supernatural, so vampires, Frankenstein, ghosts, these do not fall under the realm of cryptozoology. Although I will say that um, some recent cryptozoology and cryptozoologist theorists have started uh, postulating extraterrestrial and ultra-terrestrial origins for some of those creatures. None of those theories uh, really reach into the cryptids that have been cited in Montana, so we're not gonna get into to that, those details either. So having an understanding of what, zipto, of what cryptozoology is, um, we also need to understand the terminology used by cryptozoologists. And the biggest one for us today is the term cryptid. So a cryptid is any creature that may or may not exist. Uh, sightings of various cryptids have been reported, but their reality is not proven. The, the term cryptid helps us circumvent some of those vague, uh, the vague terminology of like hidden animal, because whenever you say hidden animal, is that an animal that's unproven or is that just an animal that's behind some bushes? Um, it also 
helps us circumvent the issues with the term monster. Uh, monster can be very misleading. And a lot of people, a lot of cryptozoologists do not believe that these creatures are monsters. They're entirely naturalistic. They're, they're behaving um, naturally, so that does not put them in the realm of horror and of things to be feared. Cryptozoology as a field uh, has several hallmarks to it. Uh, it's not just about creatures that we can't prove to exist. Cryptozoology is actually much bigger than that. Uh, it includes things, um, you know, the, the primary hallmark of cryptozoology is this belief that the known fauna of Earth is incomplete. And this, of course, leaves open the possibility of new discoveries, that we can discover new creatures all the time when we have that empirical, physical evidence. But it also includes things um, like species that were once extinct or once considered extinct that have, re that have survived. So things like dinosaurs, that, that there could be instances of dinosaurs that we believed were extinct but have survived in, in an isolated pocket or an isolated environment. Uh, in fact, there have been instances of fish, for example, that we thought were extinct and then uh, biologists and marine biologists have surprisingly rediscovered this. And at that point, that fish crosses the, the realm of being cryptozoology to biology. It includes uh, creatures um, who have only been documented using circumstantial evidence. And that because of this evidence, investigating this evidence can speed up the con or speed up this rediscovery. So things like um, one of the really interesting things about cryptozoologists is that they, as scientists, they place equal weight to evidence from oral histories, from folklore, and from indigenous stories, indigenous cultures. Uh, for a lot of biological scientists, that information is considered secondary. Um, the biological scientists require physical carcasses. They require physical evidence to prove a creature's existence. For cryptozoologists, equal weight is placed on those oral traditions. And by examining those oral traditions, it can help speed up the discovery of new creatures. We also see uh, cryptozoology covering real creatures, real species, who have been mythified beyond recognition. Uh, so in other words, a real creature exists, but because of the mythology surrounding that creature, it's almost like two different animals. Um, for example, there was a biologist in Myanmar who was following indigenous stories of a, of a creature that sneezed every time it rained because the water was sucked up its nose. By following these stories, he actually was able to identify a new species of snub-nosed monkey. Uh, so that's an ex another example of us, of a creature, of a real species that has been mythified so much that it now represents a completely different, um, completely different animal. And then, of course, it also covers isolated pockets of a real species that may exist far outside of an accepted range. So again, a real animal, but it's living in a place that it shouldn't. A uh, prime example is, especially along the east coast of the United States, uh, saltwater sharks are being found far inland in freshwater rivers. This, so until those sharks were ca captured by biologists, they would have fallen under cr the cryptozoology heading because it is a real species, but it's living in a place where it shouldn't. It's living in a place where conventional science stated it was impossible for it to live. What's interesting for us today is that the five cryptids that we're gonna be looking at fit into every single one of these categories. We have at least one creature, who, one animal, that can lean into, that can come out of any one of these categories. Now, for us, um, well, for cryptozoologists, uh, the field is very contested. Conventional science considers cryptozoology to be a pseudoscience. Uh, this means that it, they believe that it promotes statements that seem scientific, it looks scientific, it can fool a lot of people into thinking it's scientific, 
but instead it's um, not actually guided by scientific principles, by scientific methods of verification, uh, falsification, and bias. Um, that said, cryptozoologists greatly disagree with this label. Uh, cryptozoologists firmly believe that they're practicing, oh, sorry, they're practicing a sub-branch of zoology. Uh, cryptozoologists have a deep respect for science. They believe that their work does uh, contribute and that, truthfully, cryptozoologists believe that they are fulfilling a very important niche because they argue that science has subverted evidence of cryptid existence. So they're saying that this evidence exists, these creatures exist, but because it doesn't fit into this cookie cutter mold that science expects, science just ignores it. And so by working with this evidence, the cryptozoologists firmly believe that they're working with data that would be completely lost without their involvement. Um, I am not here to say which is accurate. I am um, simply here for us to have this conversation and to look at both sides of this because it's, it's really interesting uh, to understand how cryptozoology fits into our societal culture. It's actually had a huge influence on American society. We're gonna look at some of those examples. Uh, but it's fascinating to me that we can track the rise and interest of cryptozoology uh, with the fall of American trust in science as an empirical knowledge. So we're gonna really kind of dig into a lot of that here in a little bit. To look at the history of the field of cryptozoology, um, has anybody heard of the term cryptozoology before today? A couple of us, awesome, sweet. Uh, I am not gonna lie, when we um, suggested this topic to my boss, he had never heard the term. Uh, so for a lot of us, this feels like a new, a new firm, a new phrase. It's new. Nobody knows what this is, or um, only those in the know know what it is, and even a lot of people who've heard it don't really know anything about it. Believe it or not, cryptozoology actually has a very, very deep history. We can trace the academic origins of cryptozoology to 1892, uh, when Anthony Oadman published his work, The Great Sea Serpent. This, we can identify this, even though the term cryptozoology isn't used, we can identify this as kind of an origin, a starting point for the field, because um, Odeman combines folklore sources with biological data, uh, and then putting that together and postulating in this natural history treatise the existence in the biology, natural biology of the great sea serpent. Uh, at the turn of the century, we see an explosion of popularity in this concept of cryptozoology. Uh, we have Beyond the Great Wall, we have In Search of the Unknown, The Last Haunt of the Dinosaur, Beasts and Men, all published within that first decade of the 20th century. Um, what's fascinating to me is that it all surrounds this 1905 event when the first mounted brontosaurus is uh, put on public view for the American public uh, at the American Museum of Natural History. So the, the concept of cryptozoology and cryptids is fully realized in fiction by the early part of the 20th century. Uh, and in particular, In Search of the Unknown and The Last Haunt of the Dinosaur both are stories about adventurers who find living dinosaurs in the jungle. And we can kind of postulate, it's interesting for us, that, that these stories are, are becoming worldwide bestsellers at the same time that people are seeing their first brontosaurus dinosaur skeleton on public display. So it's raising a lot of questions. It's introducing the American public to this mystery that these creatures once existed could they still exist? And if these creatures existed, what other creatures have we missed that are still out there? Uh, in fact, even um, Tarzan, we, are, we should all be familiar with Tarzan. Tarzan, uh, in the original Burroughs story, fights a dinosaur. Uh, so we even see this example making it into world-class um, literature. Uh, this is followed, 1933, we see another jump 
an interest in cryptids and cryptozoology with the 1933 film King Kong. In fact, it's fascinating. Um, King Kong comes out in the early part of the year, and the rest of the year, there the sightings, cryptid sightings, reported documented sightings in newspapers quadruple in 1933. And it's just interesting to me that there's a possible correlation. Again, people are seeing, they're being introduced to this concept of really crazy, weird, awesome creatures. Could these things really exist? And if this thing could really exist, what else are we missing? What other creatures are we missing that could be in our own backyard? The first use of the term cryptozoology is in the 1940s by Ivan Sanderson during a radio broadcast. And a few years later, its first use in print is by, um, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna mess up this man's name and I apologize, Bernard. Uh, Bernard Hogelman, uh, in his book, On Track of Unknown Animals. And by the publication of these, of these books um, by Sanderson's use on the radio, it's introducing this concept as a potential academic field to the American public. And so um, more and more and more and more people are really expressing interest. We're gonna see uh, in a lot of ways how uh, publication and how science scientists are reporting their information and how scientists are reporting their own theories is actually helping to um, spread these ideas even faster. In 1982, the International Society of Cryptozoology was founded in Washington, D.C. It was actually, uh, believe it or not, founded by the Smithsonian Institution. Uh, and the goal was to provide uh, a legitimate avenue into academic and scientific fields for cryptozoologists. It was defunct by 1998. Uh, there was no funding available. Funders would not support the International, Society, uh, the International Organization. Um, but there was the attempt to create a scientifically based, academically founded organization. And as I mentioned, you know, we can see the rise of cryptozoology conversely mirrors the role of scientific trust in American society. So in other words, as Americans distrust science, Americans believe strongly, more strongly, in cryptozoology. Uh, so it has this inverse relationship. And to understand that, we need to understand a little bit about how the American public viewed science throughout the 20th century. Before the 1920s, science was considered to be very egalitarian. It was very democratic. Everybody had equal access to science. It was the people's knowledge. Uh, Americans viewed science as a practical, common sense mode of reasoning. This is the time of the Victorian scientists, of, German, of um, gentlemen scientists. Anyone who had the funds could set up a laboratory. You didn't have to have any academic training at all. If you had the money and you could buy a, a microscope, you could be a scientist. Um, if you had the money and you could outfit a ship, you could be an adventurer and go exploring and discover new creatures. Uh, this is really what helps capture the American public's attention. If you remember those books that were published in the first decade of the 20th century, all of those stories are about adventurers discovering new creatures during their explorations. But during the 1920s and 1930s, um, there is a shift that pulls science out of the, out of, um, you know, at home laboratories and pushes them into uh, government funded facilities or academically funded facilities. And so by the 1920s, or I'm sorry, 1940s, science has gained a lot of, mo of um, momentum in affecting American society. And so uh, science is taking more and more control of people's lives. We have in home technologies washing machines, dishwashers, the television, the radio. Uh, we have the rise of psychology to understand how people's minds are working, uh, rudimentary understanding of mental illness and how can we uh, help people overcome internal challenges in order to live uh, acceptably within the society. We have uh, 
people who are categorizing and predicting human behavior, social engineering, uh, dietary science, agricultural science, and as science is discovering and, and identifying more and more of these pieces, science is now controlling more and more of American lives. Science is now dictating government policies. And as science is, um, a lot of people are feeling that science is really reducing humanity to a predictable, predictable formula. Well, just because science says that my brain works this way, does that really mean that I don't have the choice that I think I have? Um, just because science says that I should eat this and not eat that, do I really want science telling me what I can and can't eat? Um, this might sound familiar to some of us, right? We, we as humans don't like being told what we can and can't do. We don't like being restricted into very limited boxes. And, and as science is becomes more and more cold, impersonal, um, mechanical, procedural, these are all terms that I, are identified as scientism. Um, the backlash to this belief creates fertile ground for outside scientific um, epistemologies to really grow. So anything that looks and sounds like a science but bucks against what science says is going to become really, really popular. It's going to sound really interesting and really um, fascinating for a lot of Americans. This is mirrored, and it's interesting to me, that as science becomes more and more regimented, we, it, it, it's happening at the exact same time as what uh, literature historians consider to be the golden age of science fiction. So the rise in popularity of science fiction mirrors the rise in technology, uh, but we also see that there's a greater rise in self-publishing. We see a huge influx of graphic novels. Uh, we see people able to disseminate their own ideas faster, quicker, um, for it's less expensive, and you can distribute it to a larger audience. So as science becomes more procedural, more methodical, uh, science fiction allows a, an avenue for those big, crazy ideas to grow. Uh, and part of those big ideas is, or, or what else is out there? What are we missing? Is there something else that we can find to keep that spirit of adventure alive? The blend of the rise of science fiction, recognized as fiction, with the Americans' growing dissatisfaction in science, uh, viewing science as this elite authoritarian, faceless monster, who is now controlling more and more of American lives, the American public is becoming more and more interested in the coverage of the weird. Um, and so we see what we would consider legitimate sources like True Magazine, um, Nature, Life, they're now covering stories about the Yeti, about Bigfoot. They're covering stories about Chupacabra. Uh, they're running these pieces because they know it's what people want to hear. They know it's going to attract that readership and that attention. But because, and because these stories are running in these legitimate sources, it, people are making a jump um, about, well, if it's running in Nature Magazine, it has to be real, right? And so the idea that science is beyond reproach is lost. People are no longer looking at science as this objective, end-all, be-all of American knowledge. Um, many believe that uh, they can't trust science because it is upholding societal inequalities, that, it is, that science is pushing its own uh, goals, its own purposes, and so if I can't trust science, I have to be able to look out for myself, which means anything that I want to prove, I have to prove myself. And so these scientific rule breakers, like cryptozoologists, 
really appeal to this idea of rebel rebellion. And what's interesting, um, if anybody is tracking on our timeline, the 50s and 60s, there is another pretty major world event going on that is feeding into people's distrust and dissatisfaction with authoritarian um, figureheads, and that's the Vietnam War. And so we see these things kind of rising and happening at the same time, and as American distrust continues to rise, so does that interest in the outside rebellious science like cryptozoology. This is the same time that we see a massive rise in uh, crystal healing, crystal and beliefs. We see a rise in uh, alien beliefs, alien abduction stories, alien UFO sightings. All of these things are happening at the same time. And we can, I'm, I'm not saying that these things are real or fake. What I am saying is that it's very interesting that these are increasing at the same time that Americans are completely um, becoming dissatisfied with the role of science in their life. And so that brings us up to not starting in the 1970s to today. So the last 50-ish years, um, I'm sorry, 1970 was 50 years ago, guys. Uh, <laughs> It, it opens the door for what Tom Nichols calls the death of expertise. Uh, a lot of historians call this time period post-truth. And what we find is that tighter scientific budgets, uh, additional bureaucratic procedures, more red tape, uh, pressure to generate practical outcomes, all of these things are putting more and more pressure not only on scientific labs, but also on the those publications. And so a lot of those organizations and publications that were, you know, kind of allowing some cryptozoological pieces to slide through their peer review process in the 50s and 60s, now they don't have that option. They have to put a hard stop on these stories because they no longer satisfy, they, they no longer um, match what the funders want to see. And so this uh, intentional force out of cryptozoological beliefs and cryptozoological stories only makes cryptozoologists push back harder, right? That is also a very uh, American, a very human reaction. If somebody tells you, gives you a hard no, and it's something that you truly believe in, what are you going to do? You're going to stand up stronger and you're going to yell a little louder about it. And of course, um, here in the last 20 years, the rise of the internet kind of mirrors that uh, easy publication that we saw in the 30s and 40s. And so now people are able to share these ideas and what they consider to be evidence to a massive worldwide audience with very little effort and very little work. And so it continues to feed this concept of post-truth, the post-truth world where citizens actively disbelieve science and actively seek out evidence for things that match their own worldview and their own experiences. And so, of course, this all appeals very much to cryptozoologists. This all very much um, opens the door for cryptozoology to really uh, fill, a, fill a need in people's minds and in, um, in their lives. Uh, Dan, Daniel Cohen in 1967 says, it is genuinely exciting to believe in ghosts or flying saucers or the abominable snowman or the lost continent of Atlantis but real science is nowhere near so thrilling. No matter how well it's presented, a rigorous, logical approach to evidence is hard and restrictive. It destroys the, rom the beloved romantic myths, and it is going to be resented. Because science has taken the mystery out of the world for so many, um, the rise of cryptozoology steps in to fill that, that hole. Cryptozoology's basic tenets are there are things out there that we don't know about. There are still massive mysteries in the world, and we want to find them. We want to discover them, and we want to find that evidence to show that there are still mysteries in the world. And so um, cryptozoology, in a way, is an effort to put the concepts of science back into the hands of the people. You know, today science feels kind of far away. It's, it's one of those pillars that's over there and you can't even touch it until you've had 12 years of school. Um, 
and, and even when at that point, you might still might not understand what they're doing. Whereas cryptozoology is open to anybody and everybody. Uh, and so cryptozoologists step into this role. They're looking for um, opportunities and ways to, to use science to address some of these mysteries. Um, most cryptozoologists do not have academic training. Uh, they are not credited biologists or zoologists, but that doesn't stop them from moving forward and looking for working in the field, looking for evidence. And it's fascinating that every state in the United States, every culture um, represented in the United States and beyond has creatures of folklore. They have creatures of horror, or they have things that they are afraid of that they have to explain. And for many things, for many of these, these sightings and these stories go back generation after generation after generation. And today we see evidence of these pieces through tribal histories, through local folk tales, eyewitness accounts, um, the need to explain the unknown, or just plainly jokes played on the innocent. Uh, so we're going to look at five Montana cryptids. So these are five creatures who have all been sighted in Montana. And what's interesting is that all five of the pieces you see here relate to at least one of the cryptids that we're going to look at. Um, we're going to look at Bigfoot, the Flathead Lake Monster, the Ringdonkus, Ringdonkus, apologies, the Jackalope, and the Snipe. Has anyone been snipe hunting? Mm -hmm. So, Bigfoot. Bigfoot's probably the most popular, most well-known. Uh, he is a large, hairy, bipedal creature. He walks upright. Uh, he's semi-human. Most sightings put him between 7 and 14 feet tall. Uh, I've seen uh, descriptions that say the females tend to be a little bit shorter, tend to be a little bit lighter. So the females tend to be more of that 7 feet, 600 pound range. The males tend to be larger, heavier. Uh, most reports claim that they are incredibly fast. And most people agree that it is um, a creature with very long arms, very thick body, little to no neck, and of course their uh, large feet, hence the name Bigfoot. Bigfoot is also known as Sasquatch. Uh, Sasquatch is a Salish word that was first identified during some Salish indigenous language conservation work in the 1920, late 1920s. Uh, the term Bigfoot wasn't created until 1958 when reports were made to a Northern California newspaper. And at that point, the newspaper reported the creature as Bigfoot. And the name has just taken off. Uh, there have been sightings in every single US state except Hawaii. So apparently Bigfoot has not crossed the ocean yet. Uh, I wouldn't put it past him, truthfully. Uh, to have a creature like this that's so pervasive that from northern Canada to the tip of Florida, every state has a sighting. That's pretty cool, actually. That's, that's really impressive. The first uh, incidences, or the first recordings of Bigfoot actually are in petroglyphs in northern California. So these are prehistoric depictions of the creature, uh, the Yucat tribe, the Yucat people, the name uh, for, their, for the creature that you see here in the, in the stone carving is um, Mayak Darat, which translates as hairy man. There are also pictographic depictions of a large bipedal uh, creature covered in fur in Utah, in Arizona, and in Nevada. Uh, so the western part of the United States numerous tribes who have no relationship to each other, even linguistically, are, are depicting um, creatures like this in their rock drawings. The first non-native account of Bigfoot is from 1811. Daniel Thompson was uh, an ethnographer who was collecting folkloric tales from the Spokane tribe, which of course is what is today Washington and, and uh, British Columbia, Vancouver area, and he documents that the Spokans believe in a race of giants which inhabit a certain mountain off to the west, that they inhabit a mountain in the Cascade Mountain Range. Uh, and he does acknowledge, he documents that the giants are leaving footprints at least 18 inches long. 
the first documented encounter of Bigfoot in Montana might surprise some of you guys. Uh, the first documented instance in Montana is 1893, and it's published in a book written by Teddy Roosevelt. So if you were not aware, Teddy Roosevelt, before he became the American politician, was actually a pretty well-known adventurer and hunter, and was a really popular author. He wrote several books detailing his adventures in the American West and in other places, and his book, in the Wilderness details a hunting trip that he made across, what, across Montana as a young man. In that book, he dedicates seven pages to a tale. Um, uh, one of his guides apparently is afraid and refuses to accompany the hunting group into the mountains that sit on the border of Montana and Idaho because many years before, the guide had actually gone up trapping with a friend of his. They had encountered an unnamed uh, creature that at first they thought it was a bear, but when they had uh, really looked at the tracks, they realized that it was bipedal. It walked upright on two legs. Uh, the trap, or this guide details that the creature woke him up one night, uh, ducking into his lean-to, and that what actually woke him up was the smell of a skunky, really horrible smell, which is a detail that accompanies a lot of Bigfoot sightings. The, the guide sh shoots at the creature, scares it off, it terrifies the two men enough that they agree the next day that they're going to collect the beaver out of their trap, and they're going to leave. Well, the next day, when the guide returns to the campsite to pick up his companion and leave, the companion has actually been killed by the creature. Uh, the companion's neck has been broken, and the creature's footprints are all over the campsite. The man is so terrified that he leaves behind all of his gear and equipment. He grabs his rifle, and he runs down the mountain to get the horses. Um, this tale is, captivates Teddy Roosevelt. Like I said, he, the, the book is only 200 pages. He dedicates seven pages to this story alone. No other tale in the book is as long or as detailed as this one. Uh, and Teddy never identifies the creature. He never gives the creature a name. However, cryptozoologists and historians looking back at it do say it's large bipedal, has human-like footprints, has a very skunky smell, and has a, a rumble sound. That sounds a lot like the Bigfoot sightings, the Sasquatch sightings that we hear from across the country. Uh, so how fascinating is it? The first Montana sighting is 1893. So it's actually just 11 years after Billings is established and it comes from Teddy Roosevelt. Bigfoot sightings are pretty consistent here in Montana, uh, including the surprise of 19, uh, 1995 when Whitefish, Montana wakes up to learn that they have gained international recognition that uh, Bigfoot was finally shot and killed there. Now, nobody in Whitefish knew anything about this. Um, it, it's, uh, in fact, the, the, reporter, the reporter actually contacted a Montana Game and Fish sergeant and the sergeant is um, asking about whether or not uh, the Game and Fish Department needs to be involved in poaching of this creature. And the officer says, um, he's quoted as saying, if the hunter poached a Bigfoot or Sasquatch, you can guarantee that it's not gonna be in our jurisdiction because it's not a game animal. As far as I know, it is not illegal to take a Bigfoot. <laughs> Sightings continue, including a 2012 sighting very close to home. This happened in Carbon, the sighting is from Carbon County. Um, so just down the road, guys, right outside of Red Lodge. Now, these, this photograph is from the Bigfoot Field Researchers Association. The hikers claim they take the picture and that there's a black shape here in the woods. Uh, they went back the next day just to verify that it wasn't like a tree trunk and it was open and so the one hiker goes back. This is the photograph duplicated with the hiker wearing a white shirt in the same space to illustrate that um, it had to be a, a creature of large size sitting in that area. Again, I'm not saying yes or no, um, but it is again interesting. Right in our backyard, we have a sighting of Bigfoot 
Uh, by the way, if anybody is interested, there is also a video on YouTube of a supposed family of Bigfoot in Yellowstone National Park. Uh, so we don't have time to look at that today, uh, but if you're interested, I can certainly point you in that direction. Today, Montana has the, is the fifth highest sightings per capita in the country. Uh, we follow Washington, Oregon, West Virginia, Idaho, and, and then comes Montana. The most recent Montana Bigfoot sighting was in April of last year, so April 2020, uh, which makes sense because a lot more people were outside in, with COVID. So then our second cryptid in Montana is unique to Montana, and that's the Flathead Lake Monster. The Flathead Lake Monster can only live in Montana because it only lives in Flathead Lake. It's described as being eel-like, uh, 30 to 40 feet long, up to 1,500 pounds, limbless, covered in scales, with a head the size of a horse. Now, in the 1960s, the Courier newspaper dubbed it a USO, an unidentified swimming object. Um, many people disagree as to what this creature is. Some people believe that it is a dinosaur that has survived and has just been um, unidentified. It's just kind of slipped by us. Uh, other people believe that it's a giant sturgeon who has lived outside of its range. Giant sturgeon have been found in lakes in Idaho. There was a seven-foot sturgeon that we will discuss in a minute caught out of uh, Flathead Lake. But, and so some people believe that the sturgeons have grown even bigger to 30 and 40 feet. Regardless if it's a dinosaur or a sturgeon, it does fit within our cryptozoological umbrella because remember cryptozoology includes prehistoric creatures that survived to modern day. It also includes, includes those existing species who are living outside of an accepted territory. There are hundreds of sightings of the Flathead Lake Monster, usually one to two a year. Most are in August and September, so early fall, although something happened in 1993 because there were 13 individual sightings that year. Don't know why, don't know how, uh, but going from an average of one to two sightings a year to 13 is a pretty big jump. The monster itself it's really unclear about the origins of the creature uh, in regards to social, sociological tradition. Um, some claim it does have Kootenai origins. I will be honest, I have not been able to find a source for that. The story that I saw um, was a tale that the earliest inhabitants of the lake area lived on an island. Two young girls were walking across the frozen lake. They see antlers sticking up out of the lake and they thought it was a drowned animal. So they cut the antlers off, which awakes the creature that breaks the ice and then drowns half the inhabitants on the island. Again, I don't know the origin of that story. Um, I cannot confirm or find a specific indigenous source for that. But I can tell you that the first documented sighting of the Flathead Lake Monster is 1889 uh, by Captain James Kerr of the steamship the U.S. Grant. According to Kerr, he and his crew and over 100 passengers were on the ship on the lake when they saw what they thought was driftwood. As they got closer, they realized that the driftwood was actually coming towards them at a ramming speed. One of the passengers fires a rifle at it, at which point it submerges, never to be seen again. I say that never to be seen again, never to be seen again by them. Uh, Historically, early commercial fishermen reported that their nets had been shredded by an unidentified species of fish. Uh, others have claimed to have seen the creature on fish finders. Um, in the 1950s, Big Fish Unlimited offered a $1,400 reward to anyone who could catch a fish larger than 14 feet. Uh, the courier uh, followed them with a $25 reward for the first authentic picture of the creature. The only person to collect on either award was C. Leslie Griffith, who uh, caught that seven-foot sturgeon near Cromwell Island off the western shore. There was actually a lot of controversy as to whether or not he actually caught the fish or if he shipped it in from somewhere else, dropped it in the water, and then caught the fish. Um, it actually went all the way to the Montana State Supreme Court. Um, 
But he was awarded his $1,400, even though it was only seven feet instead of 14 feet. Today, that mount is on display at the Polson Museum. So you can actually go see uh, Griffith's seven foot sturgeon. Sightings actually come pretty recently. In 2017, it was reported to uh, have saved a three-year-old child. Uh, the three-year-old couldn't swim and was found soaking wet at the end of the dock. And the boy reported that he had fallen into the water and the monster lifted him back out onto the dock. Um, at least that's how the newspapers reported it. Very interesting. Our third Montana creature is the complete opposite side of the state. We're jumping back and forth a little bit, and it's the Ringdocus, or the Ringdocus, uh, depending on how you'd like to say it. This is a very new creature for a lot of people. They are not familiar with this at all. Uh, it is a dog-like creature with raised shoulders. It has kind of a hyena uh, body to it. It's considered to be a nocturnal hunter, about 100 pounds, between five and seven feet long. Uh, the color of the coat ranges all over the place, orange, white, black, brown, spotted. Um, I haven't seen any reports of stripes yet, but I wouldn't put it past the creature. He seems pretty inclusive. Uh, and of course, it, it's said to have human-like cries at night. This creature can be directly traced to Iowa tradition. So the Iowa people are of Siouan descent. They're part of the Sioux uh, extended indigenous culture. Uh, in Iowa tradition, they had um, native tales of a creature that snuck into camps at night to eat dogs. And the Iowa word for the ring ducus is um, shuhawa raking, which directly translates to carry off dogs. The first non-native documented sightings go back to the 1880s. And in 1886, Israel Hutchins, who was a rancher in Madison County, uh, shot a wolf-like creature that was trying to attack his cattle. Very interesting creature. He said he just couldn't figure it out. He sent it to a local taxidermist who put it on display just over the Idaho border. Um, in, it was, uh, people lost track of it for several decades, and in 2007, Israel's grandson tracked it down and returned it to Montana. So this mount is currently on display at the Ennis Museum, if anybody is interested in going to take a look at it. Uh, by the way, the Smithsonian Institute has not been able to identify it. Stories of this type of creature, though, continue. In 2005, uh, newspapers reported on the creature of Macomb County. Uh, this animal was credited, this cryptid was credited with killing more than 120 livestock across Macomb, Dawson, and Garfield counties. Eventually, a rancher was able to shoot and kill the creature. Uh, DNA sequencing identified it as a domesticated wolf who had been released into the Montana countryside. Again, in 2018, a cryptid creature was attacking uh, cattle in Denton, Montana. Uh, the rancher shot the four-legged creature, but wildlife officials were completely puzzled by it. Its canine teeth and front paws were too small for a wolf, but the claws on all four feet were too long to be a wolf. Its ears were too big, but the coat was the wrong color. And um, all they could say was that it was young, a young, non-lactating female. That's all they could say. Uh, they did send DNA to Oregon to be sequenced, who reported that it was a gray wolf from the Northern Rockies. The only justification that they could say for the unusual appearance is that it may look odd because of the animal's youth. DNA sequencing made it turn, um, said that it was a wolf, but it still looked really funny. Our fourth creature, I'm trying to track our time for us so we don't run too far. Uh, our fourth creature is actually really, really fascinating because the people who created it admit to creating it. They admit that they make it up. But the history of documentation of this creature is fascinating and I guarantee you it's gonna be surprising. So the jackalope, of course, is a prairie creature with the body of a rabbit or a hare, but has antlers either from a deer or from a pronghorn. Um, early in the 1940s, people claimed that if it had white-tailed deer antlers, it was a buck bunny, and if it had pronghorn horns, it was an a jackalope. 
Today, we have gotten rid of Buck Bunny, and we just use the term jackalope to cover all of them. Uh, it's usually about two feet tall, can weigh up to 60 pounds, speeds up to 30 miles an hour. It is considered to be a vicious little creature, a la Monty Python. Monty Python. Um, Although there is some disagreement as to how they reproduce. Some people claim that uh, it only happens during 100-year floods when floodwaters push the rabbits out of the burrows and the, the female rabbits meet up with the male deer. Uh, others say that they can only mate during an electrical storm. Um, it's unclear. We have no idea. Uh, the only, it is agreed, though, that the only natural predator is the wolf. But when we look at jackalopes, there are actually depictions of horned rabbits that go all the way back prehistorically. This is a Mesoamerican petroglyph. So Central American Aztecan depictions of a rabbit with a horn. This is actually a Turkish 13th century manuscript. And yes, we have a dragon and we have a, a lion, but we also have a rabbit with a unicorn horn. Depictions continue, and between 1580 and 1805, there are dozens of European natural history manuscripts that depict a horned rabbit. Now, this is really fascinating to us, right? But if we look scientifically, in 1933, an American scientist mapped and officially identified the Chauve papilloma virus. This virus particularly infects rabbits, and it causes keratin-like growths, bony growths, to grow out of the rabbit's coat all over its body. So we can feasibly see that if you catch sight of a rabbit across the field and it's got a thing sticking out of its back, it's going to look like a horned rabbit, right? So for me, I find it really fascinating that this virus is officially identified in 1933. In 1934, a pair of brothers out of Douglas, Montana go rabbit hunting. When they come home to their taxidermist shop, they throw the rabbit on the floor. It slides into a pile of antelope horns. The one brother turns to the other and says, we got to mount that thing. <laughs> 1934 is the very first jackalope mount as we recognize it today. They sold it for $10 to the local bar. Let's face it, $10 in 1934 at the height of the Great Depression, that's, that's not a little amount. Um, apparently, the locals loved this sucker. All of the tourists, all of the visitors thought it was real. And so here we have the perfect opportunity for an inside joke. Somehow, believable lore springs up about the jackalopes. These legends are kept alive by shopkeepers and trail guys and bus drivers and bar keeps and um, everybody in town uh, to, as they say, pull the visitor's leg and lighten their wallets. Popularity quickly grows to include Texas, Montana, Colorado, Idaho, Utah, and more and more um, requests for the mount grow. Uh, so today, Douglas is officially proclaimed to be the home of the jackalope. By the way, if you're interested, there are people who claim that in 1995, when they released wolves into Yellowstone, they also released 40 breeding pairs of jackalope into Yellowstone National Park. And so today, there are over 28,000 jackalope running around in Yellowstone. So the next time you go to Yellowstone, keep an eye out. Our last Montana cryptid is really interesting because it is a real animal. Remember one of those hallmarks of cryptozoology is that real creatures, real species can be mythified to the point that they no longer re uh, resemble the actual creature. We have that with the snipe. The snipe as a bird was first described by John at Audubon in 1861, um, and it has a long history as a game bird. In fact, our word sniper was originally given to mili uh, British military men who could shoot a snipe out of the air with a single shot. So they were able to snipe the bird. Uh, David Thoreau describes the particular spirit-suggesting sound in the mid-1880s. We're going to see if we can hear it today.
So if you're unaware of the bird, that does sound a little, a little creepy, not gonna lie, right? The mythology that comes up with, a, with this, oh, sorry. Um, so the snipe, of course, it's a shorebird. It lives in wet marshes. It's about nine inches long. Um, it has a two inch bill. The sound that we just heard is called winnowing. It's actually not a vocalization. Uh, what happens is that the, when the bird dives, it can dive at speeds of up to 50 miles an hour. And the way that it spreads its wings, it causes air to move through the feathers in a really unique manner. And that's what creates that sound that we heard, um, which was part of the reason why nobody could identify the sound, because you could never see the bird make the noise. Uh, What's the mythology that comes up around the snipe and the why and the reason why it can fall under cryptozoology is what surrounds snipe hunting. So of course, how many of us have been snipe hunting? A couple, oh, mm, yeah, gotcha. Uh, so of course, uh, snipe hunting as the prank dates to the mid 1800s where you would take an unsuspecting uh, ignorant soul out into the, uh, the brush. You'd give them an empty bag, give them a candle or sticks or salt or something to attract the birds. You would leave them there so that you could go drive the snipe toward them and then literally leave them holding the bag. It's actually where that phrase comes from. And then you just go back to town and you wait to see how long it takes them to realize they've been had. Um, Snipe hunting in Montana dates way back. We, the first report that I was able to find is a snipe hunt from 1907 near Great Falls where 14 men take out three of their friends. Um, they leave them there and when the three men eventually make it back to town, as the newspaper reported, it seemed the entire town turned out to greet them. <laughs> We have additional accounts in 1912, in 1914, um, sometime between 1907 and 1912, the addition of salt has been added. If you sprinkle salt out, it'll immobilize the birds and you can scoop them up. Sometime in the 40s, they add that if you bang sticks together, the sticks will attract the bird. So by 1995, we have an established hunting procedure to get the snipe. And let's be honest, you only hunt snipe once. After that, you conduct the hunts for other people. So these cryptids, um, you know, snipe is a bird, I should say, uh, is, is not a cryptid as we understand it today, but the mythology surrounding it definitely fits within cryptozoology. Interestingly enough, you can go snipe hunting. Montana is one of 25 states who list snipe as a game bird. Over 2,000 snipe are shot in Montana every year. Now for us, it's fascinating that cryptozoology has a massive influence on the American public. Um, and this concept of, part of that is, part, is this concept of fake lore. There are a lot of believers in cryptids. And again, I'm not here to say that they are or they aren't. But what I am, um, unfortunately, one of the things that we see is this concept of fake lore where people with academic credentials or people who are trusted as academic and objective sources present, knowingly present, falsified information as if it were real biological data. So whether it's the Bigfoot Museum um, run by the Hoopla Nation in Northern California, or it's the Field Guide to the Northern Jackalope, which by the way is on sale here at the Western Heritage Center if you're interested. Um, hint, hint, wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Or the mockumentary Mermaids that was run on the Discovery Channel. Well, you know what? It was produced as a real documentary and it was run on a trusted TV site for education. It has to be real, right? Or if it's a TV show run on Animal Planet, the, the concept, the, um, it, this concept of fake lore sometimes confuses people into what is real and what isn't. And it confuses them into how to judge empirical data for themselves. Con cryptozoology's influence continues into pop culture. Um, whether you're of the millennial culture and you loved Harry and the Hendersons as the movie, or if you're of a slightly younger generation with Disney Pixar's Up and Kevin the Snipe, whether it's uh, the fact that you can hunt a jackalope on the video game Red Dead Redemption, 
or the original monster truck. In 1979, a Denver construction contractor painted a Bigfoot on the side of his souped up truck, creating the first monster truck. Or, children, cover your ears for just a minute for me. Thank you, guys. Um, there is cryptid erotica, guys. <laughs> just saying, and it is big business. There you go. We're good, kids. Thank you very much for participating. We also see massive meme culture. Um, the internet loves cryptids, and I'm gonna play this little video for you guys because it cracks me up every single time. I'm, oh, I'm sorry, I love her bow around her waist. I don't know who did this, but Deviant art, memes, cryptids are finding toeholds um, in American culture to the point that it has become big business. Crypto tourism is a real thing. Crypto tourism brings in over $140 million every year. There are some travel sites that are crafting cryptid specific travel packages. In fact, in and, and it's, it, it goes all the way back, in 1966, the Montana Fish and Game had a plan to do an expense, extensive survey of marine life in Flathead Lake, and the citizens surrounding the lake came up in arms. There was a huge monster protection campaign. Um, the editor of the Sanders County Ledger wrote, he said, why the unmasking of the monster myth could result in untold economic hardship to Polson and the Flathead Lake region. All the way back to 1966, they're recognizing the fact that these cryptids provide a unique economic base. I mentioned that Douglas, Wyoming um, is considered to be the home of the jackalope. Douglas continues to use the jackalope to uh, draw economic interest, and believe it or not, the jackalope was the chief economic driver of Douglas until the 1970s. In the 1970s, a uranium mine finally supplanted the jackalope, but it continues to be big business today. We have brands who are using cryptids. Um, there is a Flathead Lake gourmet soda company. Uh, Jack Link was using Messin' with Sasquatch as the main, um, as their mascot. Even here locally, guys, this was just given to me, the Big Dipper ice cream is using a Bigfoot eating an ice cream cone just down the street here. So it's big business, all the way to the point that Wyoming is using the jackalope as its logo for its lottery. So everywhere we look, we see cryptids. And people don't even care if they're real or not. They're playing on the mystery and the fun to draw interest. And so today, 14% of Americans believe in the existence of Bigfoot. Guys, that is more people than voted libertarian in the 2016 election. 14 people believe in the existence of Bigfoot, and there are over 6,000 fans on the Montana Bigfoot Project's Facebook page. And there are some pretty big name believers, including Jane Goodall. Jane Goodall firmly believes in the existence of, of a Bigfoot creature, of a Sasquatch creature. So it's interesting that this, this concept has completely infiltrated American public, the American public, and we see that it it conversely mirrors how Americans trust science. And as science takes away the mystery of the world, people are seeking a way to continue to have access to that mystery and to seek answers. And cryptozoology provides that um, to the point that it's kind of a double-edged sword. You know, the point, the purpose of a, for a cryptozoologist is to prove the existence of a cryptid, is to prove the existence of a creature. But once a creature has been empirically proven to exist, it is moved out of cryptozoology and put into biology, which means that the cryptozoologist loses control of what they've spent years of their life seeking. So a lot of cryptozoologists don't want to take that last step. You know, we see here, Ralph Herrick was one of the original creators of the jackalope. And that last statement, why make people mad? <laughs> Jack Kirby is the grandson of Israel Hutchins, the man who killed the Ringdokus. Jack Kirby is the man who, re who found the creature in 2007 and returned the mount to Ennis, Montana. The family has staunchly refused 
to have the mount DNA tested. They will not approve testing for that creature. And his response is, do we really want to know if it's real or not? Do we really want to know? Then we lose the fun. So that's what I'm gonna leave you with, guys, with that question. Do you really wanna know if Bigfoot exists or not? Or is the mystery enough for us? So I thank you guys for joining us today. I will open the floor to any questions that you might have. Um, and like I said, I can get you the link to the, the Bigfoot family in Yellowstone if anybody wants to see it. Thank you very much, guys. Yes, ma'am. Do we know if there's a recording of the youngest dog? The ring docus? Um, we do not. The, the human-like cries that, we've, that, that have been reported, um, all of those reports predate the easy recording equipment that we have. Um, Israel, Hutchins grand, or Israel Hutchins' son actually has a memoir and he recounts the night that Israel shot the dog and he says that the cries were spine chilling. Um, but to my knowledge, no recording of such creature exists. Any other questions? Okay, well guys, enjoy. I'll give you a heads up. We are actually planning next year a cryptozoology exhibit where we will be able to go into these concepts in more detail. Um, say a prayer, cross your fingers. I'm hoping we might be able to get some of these mounts here, but we have to approve, go through all of the museum paperwork to get that to happen. Um, so have a fantastic day, guys. Thank you so much for joining us.